Hi everyone, I'm Philip. I work at Bloomberg. They make me put the slide in every presentation. And I'm here today to talk about passing function arguments by value through abstractions. So uh, I'll go over what I mean. But you know, we can pass things by, by reference, L value reference, R value reference, and value. Value is nice, but uh, there are some caveats around passing values through an abstraction like std function, function ref, any invocable, anything like that. So to clarify what I mean, I'm going to use a class. So this class named mountain is interesting because uh, we can't copy it, we can't move it. The mountain doesn't come to us, we have to come to the mountain. And yet, despite this, we can have functions that take a mountain by value. So when I do this, I can call my function, and I can pass it a temporary mountain, and this works. There is no copy, there is no move. The mountain that I construct here is the mountain that the function sees, the same object. Now, if I have a base class, with a pure virtual function that takes a mountain by value, and then I inherit from it and override the function, <coughs> I can have a derived class, and I can call the function through a base reference and pass it a mountain by value, and this also works. So even though the exact function I'm calling is determined in principle at runtime, the mountain value still goes through, no copy, no move. And for lambda, it's the same. Uh, are you able to use the microphone? <sighs> I don't think that's set up for it. Oh. If, if, you, if you can't hear me, just come closer. It's the best I can do. Okay. Like, are these recorded? Yeah, they that may not, that might yeah. not be working. You might not. I'm sorry, what now? <laughs> my hearing is also about as bad as my voice. Oh, like, if it's being recorded and you don't have the mic, that might be a. I mean, I oh, no, I have a mic. There's, there's oh, okay. like a little tiny. Yeah, OK, let's continue. If you have questions about the presentation, please interrupt. So lambdas work the same. We can pass the values through. No copy, no move. Works great. But if I try to put the lambda in something like an std function and pass a mountain to that, this won't compile. Now, the reasons why it won't compile boil down to the fact that std function and other abstractions like it move the value, move the arguments that are passed by value. Uh, to understand why it happens, let's look inside. So fundamentally, inside of an std function, you have, uh, well, the constructor, which is sufficiently constrained, right? It has to only permit objects which can be called with the arguments. And this constraint it's not exactly like this, but it, this gets the idea across. It's saying, can I invoke this object with the arguments? And the way it determines that is by, well, we can write a concept, right? That given an object of our type, let's try to invoke it with the argument values. Now, decalval, it's supposed to be able to create objects out of nothing for the purpose of, uh, you know, template and stuff without having to worry about how those objects can be constructed. So I can just conjure args from, no, from nowhere. And decalval respects the value categories that we ask of it. So if we ask it an L value reference, we get an L value reference. R value reference gives us an R value reference. But if we ask it for a value, we get an R value reference. And that's not really what we want to happen here. <coughs> So uh, the other part of it is, let's say I have a function taking a mountain by value and another function returning a mountain by value. I can call my normal function with that result and this works, right? There is no copy, there is no move. The value returned is the value that my normal function sees. Now, if I add a second function that returns an R value reference <coughs> and I try to call the normal function with that result, that does not work. The reason why it does not work is because the compiler attempts to construct the normal function argument from an R value reference 
returned by this function. And mountain is not move constructible, so this does not compile. So there is a difference between passing a value and passing an RLD reference. And this difference is especially important inside the implementation of an STD function. So remember that these are the arguments specified by the user. They are potentially values. Now inside we have a pointer to some object that we want to call and a func, a pointer to some function that will cast the bound object to its original type and forward the arguments. Now the call operator just invokes a thunk, forwarding it the bound object and references to all the arguments. This is okay so far, but what happens next is critical. So the thunk, it, it looks like that, right? It, it's just some function template that knows what bound points to. It casts the void pointer back to the type that it ostensibly was and forwards it the arguments, but those are potentially values that were passed in, but down here, those are references, not values. And we've just established that passing a reference is different than passing a value. It doesn't always work. So what can we do about this? Well, it turns out that there is a, a trick. Suppose I have a struct boulder. It's not trivial, but it is copyable and movable. And I have a function target taking it by value. And I have a function test calling target of a temporary boulder. The assembly looks a little bit like that. The important parts are that first we construct a temporary boulder. Then we call the target. And then we destroy our temporary boulder. If I change the signature of target to take an R value reference instead, the generated assembly is identical. <laughs> yeah, somebody knows where I'm going. Thank you. And uh, it, see, it has to be identical because on this platform, which is the one that I work on, it follows the Itanium ABI, which states <coughs> that when passing a parameter type that is non-trivial by value, the caller must allocate it, must create it, and then pass it as if by reference. So the ABI says that they have to be the same. And what's non-trivial? Well, non-trivial is basically <coughs> what we think it is. It's, a, it's something that's not trivially copyable, movable, etc. Well, fortunately for us, we have a type trait which checks essentially that property of a class. So now we can kind of put it all together and use it, or abuse it, as I might say. So. The trick. First, we're going to take the address of a function we want to call, yielding a pointer to function type. Next, we will reinterpret the cast this pointer into a slightly different pointer to function type, where we, where we replace each non-trivial value argument with an R value reference. And then we call our function through this new pointer to function type. And this works. The assembly generated is identical as before, no change. And we can take it one step further. If we can pass this new function pointer and our value reference. So there, we've solved it. We can now pass an R value reference to a function taking a value and it's going to work. The rest of my presentation is going to be just using the script to implement an abstraction that wraps it up nicely. So let's do that. Yeah, the abstraction is function ref. I like it. It's easy. It's specified as a class of one template argument that is a function type that can be no qualifiers or const or no except. But let's focus on just the basic one because really they're all more or less the same. So what are we going to have? We're going to have a pointer to the object that we want to call and a thunk function whose type we're going to get back to in just a few slides. We're going to have some constructors all appropriately constrained, and we're going to have a call operator that takes the arguments that we take and forwards them to the thunk. This is boring. Now, 
the type of the thunk is not just take forwarding references to all the arguments. No. Instead, we want to have slightly special logic. Yes? Can you go back a slide? Of course. So the call operator receives args by value? Yes. And typo, that should say return. But moving on. Yep. The way this is going to be a little table, and the way to read it is on the left, you have how the function ref is specified. And on the right, you have the type of the thunk function pointer. So if a function ref is specified as taking a reference to int, then the thunk takes a pointer to bound object and a reference to int. And same for const and same for r value reference. In other words, references are unchanged. If I take a reference, the thunk takes a reference. Now, if we're passing in something trivial, like an int, or some trivial class type, then the thunk takes those by value. Would anyone care to guess why? It's okay. One. The register? Exactly. That's the API says so. That's, well, the ABI, we have some, a little flexibility here. The ABI says so, but trivial stuff is in all likelihood going to be in registers already. And if we were to make this forwarding references and the compiler could not inline the whole thing, <coughs> then it would be forced to spill all those trivial things to the stack, and there's just no benefit to doing that. So this is, if we're already looking at the ABI, it's a nice optimization to do. Would, would you want to constrain that on small trivial objects? No. Whoa. Because uh, the register conventions will already take care of that. So if it's a small trivial object, it's going to fit into the first several registers, and that's fine. If it's um, a large trivial object, it's going to be on the stack, and then, then I don't care too much, really. Yes? Was this all motivated by performance or something else? N well, performance is a nice side benefit. Unmovable. It's, it's, you could not, could not do this at all with immovable objects before. So I guess what's the motivation for like, wanting to do this? <laughs> well, if you're going to force me to answer that, <laughs> one year ago I was at a talk that talked about a type erasure in different languages. Um, I forget the details, but the concept is, for dynamic languages like, say, Python, it doesn't matter because everything is a reference anyway. For something like Rust, Rust doesn't have the same object lifetime, sorry, object identity semantics as C++. So it's more or less free to mem copy the bits around as it wishes. So it doesn't have the same restriction as, as we do. Whereas in C++, we construct an object, we have to destroy the same object. And if something is passed by value, that value has to be a distinct object from every other. So therefore, if we have a, a library abstraction like std function that wants to take things by value, it has to copy or move. And that really bothered me, that we have to have this drawback. So I, I thought about it, and turns out we don't, if we cheat a little bit. Yeah, right. So if something is trivial, we pass it by value. And at this point, sure, you can constrain it to say if it's a small object. That's, that's fine. But if something is not trivial, we convert those to our value references. So let's write a little type trait that does this transformation. So given some type name t, if it's a reference, we leave it alone. If it's trivial and small, we leave it alone. Otherwise, it's an R value reference. Add a little alias, and now we have our thunk type, where we just apply the transformation to every argument. Make sense? Okay, so what's left is the constructor. We're going to impl implement a constructor for free functions, member functions, and function objects. Let's go. So if I, want, if I have a normal function taking a mountain by value, I want to be able to construct a function ref that calls that function and pass a mountain value to it without any copies or moves. How can we do this? Let's write a constructor. It takes a pointer to function. This function doesn't have to match the function ref exactly. It just needs to be compatible. 
and we're going to constrain it to make sure it is. Now here we can't use any standard constraint because remember those don't really respect the distinction between values and R value references. So we're going to do our own and we're going to constrain it to make sure that for every argument that the function graph takes, we can convert that value into a corresponding value args2 that the function pointer takes. And we can convert from r2 that the function pointer returns into r that the function ref returns. Make sense? So what's the constraint? Well, we want to deal with values, right? <coughs> so we're going to start with a concept. <coughs> if the types are the same, then obviously that's going to work, so we just short circuit. If they're not the same, we need to check, given a value of type from, can I put it where a value of type 2 is expected, but not go through any R value, L value, R value reference conversion, none of that. So what we need is a function. Let's conjure up a reference to function that returns my starting thing by value and a reference to function that takes my ending thing by value. And if I, call, if I can call the latter function with a former function's result, <coughs> see, this is essentially what we want to do. Just pass it through without any copies or moves or forwarding, none of that. And if this were to work, then our constraint is satisfied. So now that our constructor is sufficiently constrained, all we need to do is save the address of a function we wish to call and generate the appropriate thunk. Now this thunk, its job is to forward all the arguments to the function that we have. So it's going to take a pointer that will point to our target function, whose type is r2 args2. It's going to take the arguments that we are given, and then it's going to, well, the type of the original function is there, but we're going to synthesize a slightly different type one where each non-trivial value argument is converted into an R value reference. And we're going to cast the void pointer into this type instead of the original and call it. That's it. We're done, this works. So now if I have a normal function taking something by value, I can construct a function ref that calls it without any intermediate copies or moves. Next, member functions. If I have some object with a member function that takes a mountain by value, I want to be able to construct a function ref that will call that member function. I tell it which member function to call, I give it the object to call, and then I can pass a mountain by value and the function ref will call the function I want without any copies or moves. How can I do this? Well, let's write a constructor that takes the member function to call as a non-type template parameter. It has to deduce a bunch of things like the return type, the class that I am going to have, and the arguments that this member function takes. And the address of the member function itself, it's a template argument, kind of. We need to constrain this the same way, that for every argument that the function ref takes, we can convert from it to the corresponding argument that the member function takes, following the same rules, and we can do the same for the return type back. And all that's left, now that the constructor is sufficiently constrained, is to save the address of the object that we want to call. Yes? Sorry, how many times does the object get destroyed? Can you say that one more time, please? Yeah, how many times does the object get destroyed? Do Which this? object? Well, you're passing a single one to like through two layers, right? So wouldn't each one have to destroy it and you get a double destruction? No, that's a trick. At the top, if you're outside of the function ref, it looks like you're just calling a function and passing a value. Mm -hmm. Inside, by doing this trick, it's, it looks like it just references all the way through. And remember, the ABI says that the caller is responsible for destroying it color. Yes. Okay. So the only place that generates the destruction code is outside the function ref. Mm -hmm. So this all works. There is no double destruction. There are no copies. There are no moves. Yes. But it 
technically under five, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is, not, this is not standard, this is not portable, but on the platform that follows the ABI, it works. Yeah, you're right. Um, any more? What yes. happens if you modify the value when it's taken as reference? Can you say that one more time, please? What happens if you modify the value when it is passed by reference? Like you're doing the trick uh, to make it look like a pass by reference. Yeah. Then you're allowed to modify the value, right? That's okay. What happens if you modify the value uh, when doing the trick to pass it by reference? Well, but if you are just a normal function and you get a value, you're allowed to modify it too. The point of passing something by value is that you are the only one who has the value. You can do with it what you wish, and anything you do to this value has no impact on the rest of the program. That's why passing by value is useful. Yes? Could you go back one slide, please? Okay, thank you. Any more? Okay, I, I have a lot of slides to get through, so I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna go. So now that the thing is sufficiently constrained, we have to save the address, we have to generate the thunk, and the thunk knows both the class type of the bound object and the member function to call on it. So now the thunk is more or less the same. Its job is to forward the arguments to the member function it takes a pointer to the object and the arguments. Now, the original member function is there, but guess what we're going to do? We're going to fiddle with its type. So there it is. We have the type of the function, but we modify each argument so that if it's a non-trivial value, it becomes an R value reference instead. <coughs> and then we call it. Rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah. So that, that's just a, a bound pointer to member function syntax combined with a bunch of casts. And this works. So now if I have a class with a member function that takes something by value, and I have an object of that type, I can construct a function ref that calls that member function, and I can pass it a mountain by value without any copies or moves. Done. Last thing. What about function objects? So suppose I have a function object, which is invocable with a mountain by value. I want to be able to construct a function ref from that object that would call it, right? This should be equivalent to constructing a function ref and specifying that member function explicitly, but uh, that's not going to work in general. Because suppose that for class that we have, overloads its call operator. Now, if I say address of call operator, well, which one? I don't know. It's an unresolved overloaded function. Or what if it's a template? Well, what's a T? I don't know. So the question now is, <coughs> how do we get a pointer to the member function that would have been called with the arguments that we provide? And if you do a little time travel and go to another talk that's happening right now, I think it's called Overload Inspector, then, then uh. th that would be a nice answer. My understanding is that's a compiler plugin. What I'm going to show you next works with stock, Clang, and GCC. So uh, to motivate the idea, we can take a look at how the compiler treats pointers to functions and function overloading. So suppose I have this high order function that takes a pointer to some function that whose type is deduced. And I have a normal function, not overloaded, and I pass the address of this function to my higher order function. No problem. It's not ambiguous. T isn't. Life is good. Now, if I have an overloaded function, now this doesn't work anymore. Which one did you mean? What's T? I don't know. That's the situation we're in. We can't deduce from an overload set unfortunately. But if I change my higher order function to be not a template, it takes a specific type. Now I can pass it the address of an overload set. 
and the compiler will pick the matching one. This works. We're going to use this technique to find the best <coughs> overload and return a pointer to it. So yeah, the idea is if I have two overloads, one of them is viable and one isn't, we want to pick the viable one. If I have two overloads that are both are viable, but one is a better match than the other, like if I have an R value reference and an L value, const L value reference, and I'm starting from the pure value, then the R value reference one is a better match. So how can we do this? Well, yeah. well we're going to do some tricks, but first let's, let's define what we want. We want to write a little table that encodes the overload resolution rules of the language. So given a value and a class whose call operator takes that value, that's a perfect match, that's what we want. But if it's not a value exactly, if it's a const ref or r value ref, that's OK too. And if it's both of them, then we pick a better match. <coughs> so that's what we want. And if it's an r value reference and the class is an r value reference, that's perfect. But if it's const ref, that's also OK. But if it takes a value and the arg happens to be move constructible, that is also OK. And so on, like that. It's just a little table that encodes the rules. So how can we do this using the function pointer trick from before? Well, we're going to use a kind of tag dispatch. So a tag is just an empty class, takes a bool. Tag of false is just that empty class. Tag of true inherits from tag of false. So we have our little derived to base conversion. And we know that derived is a better match, right? So by writing our match signature this way, we can <coughs> convince the compiler to prefer one or the other by taking tag of true or false. So now if I call match signature with the address of overload of one and a true tag, it's going to pick that overload because that's the best match. And if we have a different overload set where one is viable and what isn't, and I call match signature of a true tag, well, the tag will go from derived to base and it'll pick the only match, like that. So we're going to use this trick to sort of pick the right pointer. So let's do it. Let's write a view subtraction. Pointer to memfun is the result of some class that has a bunch of overloaded static member functions named match. Each such member function takes a different pointer to member function argument and a set of tags. We then pass this overload set the address of our potentially overloaded member function. And because match like, yes, match is a template, but by specifying all the template arguments, it becomes not a template anymore. So now it becomes just a function that takes a concrete pointer to member function type. Now all the rules from before apply, and the compiler will pick the match that corresponds to the best overload of the call operator for this set of arguments. So how does that look? Yeah, and yeah, we have some abstractions, but the important part is match signature impl, it's going to recursively decompose a list of types one at, one at a time. And it's going to be like a recursive tree of inheritance until we get to the bottom and we have a whole bunch of functions. So let's begin. Match signature impl is a template of two arguments. Both are lists of types. The first list is a list of template, sorry, it's the list of arguments that we have yet to examine. Supposing that this list is not empty, we have first and rest. The second argument is the list of function arguments that we have already examined. And we are just going to accumulate more and more into this list. And this struct gets a lot of partial specializations. And each specialization will recursively inherit from yet more of these. So let's look at one. Suppose first happens to be a reference to const something. 
what we need to do is, well, given a Kant's preference, what can we take? Well, uh, first we strip the first thing off the type and pass it along. Then we add a const reference to the accumulator. Given a const reference, assuming nothing else, we can only take a const reference. And that's it. Now, if the type happens to be copy constructible, then in addition to allowing a const reference, we can permit values as well. Make sense? We've kind of encoded the overload resolution rules into this type hierarchy. And it's a similar trick for values and R value references and so on. Each one has a set of specializations like this. Until we get to the leaves. So once all the function arguments have been examined, they're all in the second type list. Now here we're at the like the child class, so to speak. And here we define a match static member function that takes a pointer to member function of a class whose arguments are the ones that we have picked and a tag, one tag per argument. These two together guide the compiler to picking the, to picking the match function that corresponds to the best overload of the call operator that we're going to be examining. <coughs> and it just returns that pointer. So now, uh, there's one more thing. We need to determine what, would, what is the result of actually attempting to invoke a class. Because the thing, see this function from before, it has to be, it, it can't deduce anything in order for this to work. So we have to tell it what return type to expect. And again, because all of the type traits in the standard conflate values and R value references, we have to do our own. So given a class, and some arguments, the result of invoking that class is, well, first, let's just conjure up a reference to the class. And next, we can't just use straight decalval because that returns references. But if instead of saying decalval of args, I say decalval of a reference to function that returns args by value, and then I call that, I now have actually values, not references. So yeah, yeah, this, this works. <laughs> yeah. So finally, let's put it all in a nice interface. Match signature is going to, uh, given a class and a set of arguments, it's going to return what would have been returned by a match signature of a class and calling the match member function on that and passing it uh, and telling it, hey, expect the return type to be this, the class to be that. Here's the address of an overloaded function and here's a bunch of tags. <laughs> Whatever type is returned from that is what match signature returns. And this has all been just a decal type, so I have to write it all again. And now we have a nice, spinny, friendly way to say, hey, what's a pointer to the best overload? So finally, we can write a constructor that works for function objects. We have to constrain it. We have to require that whatever the class returns, is convertible to what we want to return, and that the match signature machinery is able to find a best overload. With these constraints satisfied, all we need to do is actually nothing because we're done. We just need to delegate to the other constructor that we already implemented and give it the result of finding the pointer to the best member function. That's it. So now if I have a class with a call operator that takes a mountain by value, I can construct a function ref and I can call it with a mountain value without any intermediate copies or moves. We're done. Thank you. <laughs> Questions or do I get to go home? <laughs> yes. Do you think the language should uh, allow such things uh, to be done uh, without any behavior? And if so, how? Do I think a language should allow such things without undefined behavior? And if so, how? Um, 
I don't know. Let me answer that in two parts. Should the language allow us without undefined behavior? I don't know. This is somewhat platform specific. But if we had reflection, then this, this would be a whole lot more easier. Uh, yes, back there. You, you. Yeah. Um, did you encounter any cases, because it's undefined behavior, did you encounter any cases where the code gen wasn't what you expected, like the compiler was optimizing things away or something like that? No. no? I, I have, like, this is a QR code to repo. I have tests in there. It seems to work. No? Can you repeat where is the undefined behavior? Exactly? I'm sorry, can you speak up, please? Can you repeat where the undefined behavior would appear here? So this is undefined behavior according to the letter of the standard. So like the standard describes an abstract machine that would reject this kind of, you know. But we don't write code for the abstract machine. We write code for an implementation. And my implementation happens to support this just fine. Yes? Um, you, you just said that reflection can make this simpler, and it's not clear to me how. how can you say how? Absolutely. With reflection, I can, instead of having to detect the best match using this whole overload set of an address of an overload set trick, I can directly enumerate the set of member functions that exist. Yeah. Thanks. And I haven't thought it out all the way, but it seems like it would be a lot easier. Looks like we're done. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>